Why, all rights, I should love Daedalic Entertainment, an independent company still making point-and-click games 15 years after the games industry abandoned the whole genre? Hell yes, I should be outside their offices right now dry-humping the masonry. Oh, to be fair, I should have done that to the Wadget Eye offices already. But the first Daedalic game I ever played was... They call him Rufus. Rufus. Yeah, fuck that guy. The only way I could have gone back to capture this footage was if I'd muted the audio. So I just used my old review video instead. I don't have a problem with Daedalic as a company though. Um, let me give you an example. I'm not the biggest MC Frontalot fan in the world. Maybe it's something about his flow or the fact he looks a hell of a lot like Crazy Frog. But it makes me so happy that he's able to do something that geeky and have people support him for doing the geeky thing. I may not listen to his music, but I will happily defend him for doing it. So, I hope that's clear. Didn't like Rufus and Deponia, don't hate the company that made it. Okay? Clear? Good. So, with that, there was only one thing for it. Go to my GOG game list and try the first Daedalic game I had in there. Assuming said list was sorted in descending alphabetical order. The Whispered World was designed by Marco Hewlin, I hope I pronounced that right, developed by Daedalic Entertainment, so says the site, and released in 2009 which utterly fails to explain why it's in a 4x3 aspect ratio with a maximum resolution of 1024x768, but there you go. Set in what could be broadly termed a magical fantasy world, you play as Sadwick, a young clown with a weird voice. Don't worry about it, you get used to it pretty quickly. Who lives in a small travelling circus with his brother and grandfather, and whatever the hell this thing is meant to be. The only story set up you get is that Sadwick's having nightmares where he'll bring about the end of the world, told to him via the medium of a giant moustache. Yes, it's a giant mouth attached to a big white floating ball, but I just think of moustache whenever I see it. The rest of the story is picked up as you go. The history of the various lands you visit, people, events, creatures, all that lore jazz. And I think it's done well. It's not thrown in your face, it just comes about fairly naturally, through meeting strange new people with terrible complexions. Now, since my main gripe with Deponia doesn't show up here... They call him... Shut up! I'll turn to my other bugbear. I've obtained a better laptop since I reviewed Deponia, i.e. one that doesn't shut itself off at random. So I wasn't 100% sure about this, but judging by the battery drain I got playing this, I suspect this will still run like shit on older hardware. Try the demo first if your computer is more than 5 years old, or if you're running AMD graphics, that's what I had on my old one. But if you do do this, bear in mind that the demo itself is out of date. For example, the Special Edition actually has some options. It's a real shame that the Visionaire engine has such trouble pushing 2D sprites around because the result looks pretty great. Some of the character animation can look a bit iffy, but the backgrounds are without fault. Not quite a painting, not quite a cartoon. It's a really nice detailed blend of the two. The game's interface is technically part of the game's graphics, which would make this the perfect time for gameplay talk by means of a witty segue. Should probably have written one. Right click brings up your inventory. Cool, no problems there, it's nice and convenient. But what I really wanted to know is how you steal everything, how you interact with all the things. What you do here is you left click and hold the mouse button down to reveal a medallion interface. Only three verbs here, eye, hand and mouth, and I thought you'd just have to lift the mouse button over the action you wanted to perform, but you actually have to lift your finger and click the action you want again. This sounds like a dumb complaint, but think about Everything just how many times you're going to be doing that action in the course of playing a pointy click. I think you'll find the answer is a shitload. It makes me think of the sheer numbers of games that would copy the LucasArts scum interface, but without implementing the keyboard shortcuts or displaying the action you were about to perform based on what you'd used and the verb you were using. Basically, stealing a good idea without understanding what made it good in the first place. Except for double clicking on an exit to warp straight there, that's always welcome. <sighs> right, I've ran out of the way. Let's talk about a part of the interface I do like. Sandwick has a pet caterpillar named Spot, who you'll use to solve a fair few puzzles. At the start he's in his traditional caterpillar form, but he becomes even more useful due to the other five forms he learns, including Flat, Fire, Big Ball and Wee Boss. Mechanically it's just another inventory item, and yet it feels really different. One of my favourite sections in the game has you exclusively playing as Spot, solving a bunch of comparatively abstract puzzles with no dialogue to distract you. And it struck a thought in me. Logically, it's no different from what I've been doing up until that point. Instead of using all my items and dialogue options to progress, I was using the five forms I had and seeing what results I could produce from the surrounding environment. Fundamentally the same, yet distinct in how they felt to play in a way I couldn't really explain. But look at his little face. I've never seen anything so happy to be on fire. No. 
Anyway, the last part of the interface is the object highlighting, a feature this game shares with Deponia. Pressing the space bar it highlights all the usable objects and sentient beings in the local vicinity, which is a great feature. You can see everything at a glance, it's optional, it doesn't interfere. I don't have a problem with them putting that in. Where I do have a problem is when you make objects blend into the background so badly that you have to use it. You might say that having a bunch of floaty rings breaks the immersion, but so does doing the hotspot hunt by swiping your mouse cursor all about the screen like you're trying to get the cat to chase it. Even worse, there are sometimes a bunch of them stuck tightly together as if they're trying to get you to click the wrong one. The highlighting does work most of the time, I'm nitpicking here, but sporadic silliness like this is the kind of thing that gets my attention. That's not to say that all your time is spent with inventory and dialogue trees, you can get actual puzzles as well, like this chess one here. Which would have meant a lot more to me had I not played the seventh guest at some point, but you know, points for trying. On the other hand, I lost half an hour of gameplay because this pipeline puzzle broke on me. I couldn't put this cork down, couldn't exit the puzzle, couldn't even activate the handy skip puzzle button, and this is after the game had to be re-released pending a big bug fixing section. So I would just skip that puzzle if I were you, or at the very least, save right before it. Now I'll admit it, this game made me outright smile more than once, which, given my chronic case of resting bitch face, is quite a feat. Sadwick sounds hopelessly defeated all the time, which can lend a glorious air of sarcasm to the situation. Yippee! Finally I managed to open the gates of hell. Then they sprinkle in one or two meta moments, such as making a blatantly incorrect conversation choice, and then having the character you're talking to lampshade that fact when you go back and pick the right one. Kinda loses its charm the third time you do it, but it's nice to have the option. That example is more in your face than most. Overall, the Whispered world is more subtle than the Pony, right down to their main themes. A sedate, piano-led piece versus a heroic, horn-led orchestra piece. Basically, it's an animated film versus a bombastic cartoon. It tries to tell a story and build a world without being afraid of showing you something funny once in a while. I think the Double W more or less succeeds in all of these in the way that Deponia's wacky japes didn't. Mechanically, the two games are about the same, although I would say Deponia's two-button interface is better, but I only had to force myself to finish one of these. I do wonder what my opinion would have been if I hadn't played Deponia first. I did enjoy it, but I don't know that I'll go back to it. My fear is it's just not going to be memorable. I mean, I'm already forgetting parts of the story a few days after completing it. Except for one particular part, which I won't spoil, but the choice you get at the end is kind of bullshit. I had to try about 10 times to pick the ending that the game deemed incorrect, and when I finally managed it, I got a small cutscene before being booted back to before I made the choice. If this was meant to be a joke ending, then don't present it as this giant dilemma in the story, okay? It does get you an achievement though, that's a nice touch. And there's also a commentary from the developers, although, fair warning, it's in German with English subtitles. Damn you for forcing my monolingual ass to do some reading! I'd hesitate to even call this flawed, because it's got good points and great points, but they only add up to something average. Pretty far above average, but less than brilliant. The problems with this game weren't going to stop it being a masterpiece. I'd say get it in a sale. Steam or good old games will sort you out sooner or later. Spend a few days with it and you'll have a nice time. It's not an essential purchase, nor is it something that's going to last you a hell of a long while, but I think if you go into it with all that in your mind, it's not something you're going to regret. <laughs>